Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Mobile Robot Systems course. In this fifth lecture, we will be looking into the algorithms that we can use to get our robots to localize themselves. Because these algorithms are based on the Bayes filter, we will spend a few moments reflecting on that before digging into some specific implementations, including the particle filter, Alman filter. At the very end of the lecture, I'll say a few words about mapping, and we'll also touch base on the SLAM problem. Without further ado, let's get started. So in this lecture, we will talk about probabilistic localization, and our focus will really be on the algorithms that allow us to localize a autonomous mobile robots um, on hand of sensor data. We will look at, um, start by looking at Bayes' rule, which is really the foundation of all our probabilistic localization algorithms. And then we'll have a look at um, a couple of filter algorithms. So in particular, we'll have um, a deeper look into how the, calm, uh, how the particle filter works. And we'll have a very brief glimpse at the Kalman filter. And we'll round off the lecture by discussing map representations um, and how they can be constructed in a way that it's useful for probabilistic localization. Uh, as usual, I like to put the lecture itself into the broader context of this course. So last lecture, what we did was we focused on the foundations of perception. And we also looked at various sensing modalities that are useful um, for localization navigation with autonomous robots. And so in this course, what we'll do is take those foundations and focus on understanding how to make them useful um, for the purposes of localization with um, a strong focus on the algorithmic side of things. So to start off, I'd like to start by introducing a taxonomy of different localization problems. So first of all, we have dead reckoning, which otherwise um, can be referred to as position tracking. So this you are familiar with um, from our discussion on odometry last week. So odometry is one of the key sensor readings that is used when we're doing dead reckoning. There are other ways of doing it, of course, um, but odometry is very popular when you have wheel robots and are doing dead reckoning, either in the standalone mode or in combination with other um, localization methods. So with dead reckoning, we make this assumption that we know where the robot started off from. So we have a given initial pose um, in a given coordinate frame. And what dead reckoning then does for us is it blindly updates the pose based on differential movements. So based on these incremental um, odometer readings or other readings that tell you about how the robot is moving in its local body frame, right? So that's the first class of um, localization methods. The second class of localization methods is referred to as global localization, which allows a robot to localize itself within a global coordinate frame. Now, in this particular case, um, the initial position can be, but doesn't necessarily need to be known, right? So we're assuming in the case of global localization that we have either one of two um, key components that are available to us. So the first one we would need, the first variant, is map-based global localization, where we assume that we're given a map where we know where the landmarks are in our given environment, and we're assuming that those landmarks can be detected by the sensors that the robot is carrying, for example, laser, camera, or proximity sensors. And the method that we then use if we're given a map and we have sensors that can detect um, map features is basically by map matching techniques, right? So we try to detect what's around us and we try to match what the robot is detecting to what the map looks like to figure out where within this map the robot lies, okay? The second variant of global localization is beacon-based localization, where we're assuming that we have active infrastructure, right? So in the map-based case, we just have landmarks. These are just passive obstacles, essentially static obstacles that compose an environment. In beacon-based, we're assuming that we have some sort of beacons that are signaling to our robot, for example, via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or, or GPS if we're outdoors, and that the robot can use these beacon-based signals in order to figure out where it is in a global coordinate frame. Methods that are um, used in order to uh, e execute beacon-based localization are typically trilateration, so very common with, um, for example, uh, GPS-based methods, 
or fingerprinting, more common with Wi-Fi or signal strength based methods, and also proximity, which can be either trilateration, uh, so proximity sensing and proximity um, beacons that can be used in combination with either signal strength or trilateration methods. Right? And of course, um, there's a, a third cl class of methods where we're using global localization and position tracking combined. And actually, this is the most common uh, way forwards because it allows you um, to more robustly infer how your robot is moving within an environment for which you potentially have a map or a partially complete map. And for which you are basing uh, the assumption on that your robot has some sort of uh, dead reckoning or position tracking capable sensors on board. So the combination of these two is usually what we are uh, aiming um, to do. Now, its localization is a hard problem. And there are several challenges that um, come about when we're trying to localize an autonomous mobile robot. With dead reckoning, the typical challenges are that robots are susceptible to uh, noise in the form of either wheel slip, so the robots don't move as they think they're moving on the underlying surface. Um, because of wheel slip or slack in the actuation mechanism, cheap machinery leads to these um, artifacts. And also runaway errors. So runaway errors happen when we have minor inaccuracies in our motion model that just grow as time carries on, right? So if we think the wheel is moving by X, and even if we have no wheel slip, a slight deviation after one second will build to a, a larger deviation after say 10 seconds or 10 minutes. And these runaway errors are very hard to correct if we don't have other means of localizing the robot. Now, in terms of global localization, there are also multiple challenges. So clearly there are random errors and failures that can occur. So you can have unmodeled um, obstacles coming in that are not included in your map and your robot might think they are part of your map and wrongly classify their positions. Um, there are cases where we have non-Gaussian sensor noise from the sensors that are trying to detect um, environmental features and this is hard to overcome. Sometimes sensors simply are unable to operate. For example, you have um, the case of GPS denial in urban canyons. So autonomous vehicles might be in areas where they're simply no longer in the reach of GPS signaling and hence must fully rely on dead reckoning signals. So this is totally um, a, a case that can happen. Then of course map ambiguity, so if we have highly symmetric maps it's difficult for the robots to match detected map features with a given template or blueprint it has of, of where it's supposed to be lying. Um, dynamic environments, as I mentioned before, and um, a final type of problem which we call the kidnapped robot problem. And I will talk a little bit more about this uh, later down the road, which consists of the problem where, where a robot thinks it's actually moving on the ground, but actually it's, it's being um, shifted or pushed around or even picked up and moved by a human. And hence its odometry, odometry readings no longer represent what is happening to it in physical space. Okay. So let's now talk about how we're going to deal with the localization problem. So in robotics, we deal with localization probabilistically. And this is really the way to go for, for one main reason. The main reason we deal with localization probabilistically is because the foundation that we're building on, so our sensor models, are also probabilistic. So as you inferred already, as you're aware of, we're, we're already in our sensor models, we're already in integrating this capability of representing uncertainty. So a sensor is not certain, 100% certain of what it is actually really measuring. And because we're integrating that through uncertainty models, we have to propagate this, uh, this general concept of probabilistic reasoning and modeling to all the, throughout all the layers of our perception algorithms. And that is why overall we deal with localization in a probabilistic manner. So a probabilistic localization algorithm is composed of three main items. So the first component is the belief. So the belief is basically some estimate that the robot makes of where it lies in the world, right? So its position or its pose. 
The second component in a localization algorithm is the robot's motion model, right? So this would, for example, be our odometry um, mo model, right? So allowing the robot to infer if it knows how much its wheels are moving how, by how much it's moving in a, in a given coordinate frame. And the third component is a robot sensor or observation model. And here we're really differentiating between um, motion model that are treating odometry measurements um, as part of the control versus observations that are trying to infer something about the features that the robot is detecting in its environment, so in an exteroceptive manner. right? And of course, um, as we saw in the last couple of minutes of the last lecture, we can combine different sensors with sensor fusion um, uh, components to allow a robot to use more than just one sensor. So this little schema here describes one potential um, sequence of how we would be employing or deploying these three different components in um, a probabilistic localization algorithm. So say at x t the robot believes, um, so at a time t the robot believes that it's at a pose x sub t and it then moves uh, forward a given distance and it applies its motion model to infer roughly how much it has moved forwards to. It creates some sort of estimate of where it thinks it is at x sub t plus one and then applies a sensor model which tells the robot, hey, I'm seeing a wall at roughly this distance, then integrates these readings and updates the position x sub t plus one to more accurately represent where the robot really lies based on these sensor readings in addition to where it think it moved to based on the odometry readings. Okay? So this is how all the components come together to allow a robot to infer um, it, the most precise and accurate possible um, updated pose at the given um, time step. So again, let's pick up this slide that you're now very familiar with to introduce a little bit of notation that we will make heavy use of in um, our algorithms. So let's start by considering a robot um, that has a state at time t and we're denoting that state as x sub t. Now a robot takes sensor measurements. Um, we will denote these sensor measurements with z and we will subscript them with the time that they were taken, right? And based on a given sensor measurement, the robot would probably decide to take an action. In this case, it would decide perhaps to move from one position to the next and would hence um, exert some control, which is u sub t um, executed at the same time t, right? Now, what we're looking at here is we're looking at um, an accumulation of information as we go around this sense and um, sensing perception actuation loop in cycles, right? So we're accumulating a history of information that is presented to us as a series of sensor measurements taken at different time steps, as well as control um, data that is taken over or that is exerted, ex executed over a series of time steps as well. And we will be looking at these uh, the series of data um, within the context of our localization algorithms and employing this information to make the best possible decisions at a given time t. Now, a small side note, I just want you to um, be aware of the fact that we will actually be treating our odometry readings as control data. So u sub t is simultaneously what our odometer is telling us um, how we moved, as well as actually the the executed control, so the decision that the robot took um, to execute at the given time uh, t. So before we actually now go into learning how to deal with all this sequential information, I'm going to introduce a little bit more um, terminology. So in particular, what um, I'd like to introduce is this notion of a prior probability distribution and a posterior probability distribution. So the prior probability distribution here is going to be denoted with P of X, and our posterior is what we really want to infer, which is our P of X given Z. So what is the probability of a, a given candidate pose X, given that certain sensor readings were um, made? Okay, so these sensor readings are Z. 
Um, so the prior, as the name already says, is basically an, an estimate or a belief of a robot's state before we incorporate sensor data. And the posterior is what we're left with after we have incorporated given sensor data. Okay. So P of X given Z is, is um, a probability distribution over X and can also be referred to as one of two things. Um, just as a small reminder, um, we can either look at it as a likelihood of Z, assuming that we're at pose X, or we can look at it as a probability of X conditioned on our measurement Z. Right? So from our last lecture, we know how to incorporate sensor measurements through a sensor model, right? And our sensor model was given to us by a probability distribution, PZ of X, right? But what we're, as you probably have noted from the notation in the slide, what we're trying to get to, or what we're interested in inferring, is PX of Z, right? So it's the inverse of that. So now what the, the main question that localization algorithms are, um, are trying to deal with is how do we get to this inverse probability from um, me sensor measurements and sensor measurement models that we have constructed? And the way that we do this is, or the way, a convenient way of computing our posterior, the one that we're interested in, is by using the inverse conditional probability along with a prior probability of P of X, right? And you can see that we do this in this particular case through Bayes rule, which is a very convenient way of, of getting to this posterior, right? So in other words, if we're interested in inferring a quantity X from sensor data Z, Bayes rule allows us to do so through the inverse probability, which specifies the probability of this data Z assuming that X was the case, right? And so in robotics, this inverse probability is often coined um, a generative model because it describes at some level of abstraction how a state variable X causes a sensor measurement um, Z. So, so far we've never really spoken about time. And so in order to deal with time, we need to make a couple of assumptions. So the challenge that we have when dealing with time is that over time, information accumulates. And understanding which information is important and what information we need to use is a question that needs to be addressed because our algorithms should remain as, tra as tractable as possible. So clearly accumulating all information since the beginning of time or the beginning of a robot uh, trial or experiment is not tractable if not all of this information is essential and crucial to the robot's um, survival in the real world. And so what we're going to do in order to make um, or enable tractability of the algorithms is we're going to make um, an assumption that is based on this idea of a complete state. For those of you who are interested in digging a little deeper, I encourage you to look into Markov uh, decision processes, which is where this um, idea of complete state derives from. So if we look at these equations here um, on this panel, the key idea behind them is that the formulations on the left side, which incorporate full history of, of data, can be made to be equivalent to the formulations on the right side, based on the concept of conditional independence. So in, in the first case, what conditional independence, independence is telling us is that if I know my pose at x t minus 1, and I control the robot by u of t, then I know that, I know x of t essentially, and I know that it is conditionally independent on all other variables, and I can discard them from my notation on the left-hand side. And similarly, I know that my state x is sufficient to predict my measurements z, and I can likewise discard other variables from my notation. So that's the second line. So for example, um, what, how to understand this is simply that measurements that I'm reading at a given time t from a given pose x are simply a noisy projection of the robot's state at that given uh, moment in time. Right? And hence, all other measurements, all other information that I have accumulated up to then is not important, conditioned on the fact that I know that I'm at x, at time t. Okay. 
So this whole idea here is illustrated by the dynamic Bayes graph, where we're visualizing essentially only the quantities that impact um, the robot state at a given time t. And you can see how an x of t incorporates the, uh, the, the motion that was generated at x t minus 1 and generates sensor, sensor measurements uh, z at t minus 1 and so on and so forth, right? So I'd just like to spend a few more minutes on uh, describing or illustrating uh, the term or the idea of a robot's belief. So clearly, a robot's true state cannot be measured directly or very simply. It has to be inferred um, through uh, measurements and, and quantities that we can observe. And so in probabilistic robotics, we call this a belief or the state of knowledge, essentially, which is derived through conditional probability distributions, as uh, described to you previously. So we use this term belief um, because, as you'll see in, in later lectures, there is not just one way of representing uh, a belief, there are multiple ways. And um, I do want to note here that the belief, what is key about the belief is that we use it because we want to have this quantity that we can update after we incorporate uh, measurement, measurements uh, z of t that we're uh, essentially collecting over time. And before we incorporate our newest sensor, sensor measurements z of t, we'll use a slightly different notation. We'll use a belief bar. Okay? So the key concept here is that the step that leads us from belief bar to the belief is called computing the measurement update or the correction. And that will really be a key um, a step or a process um, that underlies all the algorithms that we'll be looking at in this lecture. So let's start having a look at what these algorithms actually look like, what shape and form they actually take. So by now we basically have all key components in place um, in order to actually formulate our first algorithm in terms of um, some pseudocode that is put together through a couple of equations. And this pseudocode actually takes the form of a filter. The understanding for this is that we're what we're doing is actually we're going to be filtering out less likely poses, which are eventually to be replaced with more likely candidate poses. Okay? And so the importance here is that the Bayes filter um, is the underlying mechanism to any state inference algorithm of a dynamical system. So let's walk through the lines of, of this uh, Bayes filter. Um, so imagine that x of t um, is a point that I want to evaluate the probability of, and I perhaps have a set of such points, right? So in the first line, what I do is I take the probability of being at all possible previous points, x sub t minus 1, and I apply the motion model that would then lead the robot to oppose um, x sub t. And I do this for, as you can see in the integral, I do this over all um, x sub t minus 1. Now this gives me a posterior before incorporating sensor data, hence my belief bar. But I'm not done yet because once I'm at x sub t, I now evaluate the sensor ob observations that I've collected. And I'm going to apply the sensor model to all these current candidate poses that are contained in this robot's prior belief, so my belief bar. And what this does is this finally returns an updated robot belief, so now my true belief at x of t. In other words, I now have my posterior. And so in from inspecting these equations, you'll note that we're actually making use of just three probability distributions which we are all very familiar with by now. So the first one is basically just our initial belief, so some distribution over my candidate poses over time. The second one is the distribution that describes my measurement probability, which is no, nothing other than my sensor model. And the third um, probability distribution is my state transition probability, which is nothing other than my motion model. And so these three quantities we have, and we have a way of building them as described in my previous lecture. And with this, we have everything that we need in order to compose the Bayes filter.
So at this point, I'd like to say a few words about the Markov assumption, since it plays a fundamental role in probabilistic robotics. And essentially, it's, it's equivalent to our assumption of a complete state. So the Markov assumption states that past and future data are independent if one knows the current state x of t. Right? So this is really what we've um, discussed and described um, in the notion of our complete state, where we talked a little bit about conditional independence. Now, the problem with the Markov assumption is that violations can happen and are actually not that uncommon. However, we often make or we often are content ourselves with these violations not leading to catastrophic um, failures. However, Problems can occur when we have significant dynamics that are unmodeled, for example, dynamic obstacles for which we are incorporating sensor data, but for which we have no map or dynamic models, or when certain probabilistic models that we're using, for, for example, sensor models are, are, are grossly inaccurate, or when we simply are making approximation errors that lead to runaway errors that are hard to recuperate from. Um, one example of when uh, information needs to be modeled if, a current, if current information is taken into account is an example of, of having a car whizzing around me, for example, going around me in circles. Now, if I incorporate seeing it at a previous time step, then this is correlated with me seeing it again at the next time step. And if I'm integrating the sensor data, and I don't model the car and its dynamics, this Markov assumption is not going to be strictly correct. So this is one example of when you might need to incorporate certain um, dynamic processes in your environment and you can't simply rely on um, the Markov assumption applying to everything. Still, it's an indispensable assumption and we make heavy use of it since otherwise computations would definitely become intractable. So now the question is, how do we implement um, this for real? So this illustration is taken from Trun's book and tells the story of the filter in an accessible way. So what we have here is a robot that is trying to localize. In the first panel, so we're looking at the very top and uh, the panels progress in time as we go down. So in the first panel, we start with a uniform distribution because the robot doesn't know where it is and it hasn't actually observed anything yet. Now the robot sees a door, it's standing next to the door, but it could actually be in front of any door, right? So the robot, um, we're assuming that the robot owns uh, or possesses a map of the environment and it knows that there are three doors in this environment. So at this point, the measurement probability tells it that it's equally likely in front of any of the three doors. And so our PDF has three modes. Now the robot keeps on moving and, uh, as, and as applies, it applies the motion model. And as we um, know from the odometry model that we looked at in the last course, when the robot is in pure dead reckoning mode, um, so without observation updates, this increases the robot's uncertainty about where it is since the robot is essentially moving forwards blindly. Now in the fourth panel, we have uh, the sensor model uh, uh, representing the fact that the robot is again observing a door. Now when we fuse that observation or that distribution with our prior that we obtained um, after the robot moved um, in the pre previous um, panel, we now, um, or this gives rise to a new posterior, which now clearly has a, a peak at the second door, because this is now the most likely um, set of positions where the robot is located at. Okay? And as the robot then keeps moving um, without making observations between the second and third door, the motion model again then leads to an increase in uncertainty as we saw previously happen, and so on and so forth. But the insight here is that after um, some motion and after two observations, the robot already has one clear mode in its belief, so in its um, representation of where it thinks it is. And hence, as uh, given that we are using these models and we're exploiting the fact that the robot owns a map, we can infer a robot's position in this non-ambiguous environment. Now, Markov localization is our theoretical workhorse, but we actually have to find a way of implementing it. 
concretely in code. And there are several options um, to do this. The first option that we're going to go through is implementing a discrete version of the filter. So our goal here, if we look at this little um, bit of pseudocode on the top half of the, of the slide, our goal here is to evaluate the probability of all cells P sub K in a set of cells that represent our state space. Okay, so you can imagine this could be a grid map, for example, where K is the index of any one possible state in, in this grid map or in, in this collection of, of states or cells that compose our discretized state space. So what the first line does is it basically goes through all our cells in our collection of cells, and for each cell K, it evaluates the probability of coming from a previous cell I for all neighboring cells I, right? And in the next line, we take the uh, observation update, where we use the priors that were computed in the line above, and we update them, given an observation that was made for a given um, cell P sub K. And at the end, we return the full set of cells, P sub K, which contains um, a discretized representation of the belief of where the robot lies in the state space. So in summary, this um, way of computing the filter relies on the states being represented in a discrete way. And it's essentially equivalent to the Bayes filter when we can't quantize over the support, or in, or in our case, the space that the robot moves in. So a little bit more practically now, how would we actually go about creating such a discretized um, state space representation? And one way we can go about this is thinking about space as a grid where we create a discrete tessellation of the state space. So we can think of creating a grid decomposition for X and Y, and also showing um, the pose, so the robot orientation, in a discretized way. And what we then do is we approximate uh, our posteriors using histogram filters. And the belief is now no more than a simple collection of discrete probability values that we normalize over the collection so that we um, indeed have uh, probability distributions. And this then enables us, so this underlying state space rep representation enables us to use the algorithm in its discrete form. So we can go back to our um, little illustration here of Markov localization and show how it would work in the case for grid localization. So it's essentially equivalent to the, to, to the slide we saw previously where we just have a discrete support for our PDFs now. Now, the downsides of this, of course, are that we now have huge memory requirements um, since we need an extra or we need entries for every quantized um, discrete element of our state space. Also, what you need to bear in mind is that the motion model requires essentially a convolution or two nested for loops because for each grid cell, we have to compute the probability that it was reached from all other grid cells uh, that neighbor it, given a control data point U. And hence, um, we're looking also, so not only at memory requirements, but also at quite significant processing requirements. And this is why later um, down the road in a few minutes, uh, we will be taking a look at an alternative filter, uh, the particle filter. So just to show you a illustration of what Markov localization would look like with a metric grid, so discrete, um, represent, representation of state space. Um, so in this uh, set of um, panels, what we have is a map with a spatial resolution of um, roughly 15 centimeters and an angular resolution of five degrees. The robot here in this trial um, is equipped with two laser range finders and is using a beam model. So at the very beginning, you can see in the underlying three plots, you can see the belief representation of where the robot might be. And um, it is roughly uniform at the very beginning. And after one sensor measurement, you can already see that <clears throat> by looking at the areas where we have dense black clusters of points, um, after one sensor measurement, the robot is already able to roughly update its belief to represent the locations where it would potentially be able to measure what it measured at that time step, given um, the laser um, 
range measurements that were um, captured. So this space here is actually highly asymmetric and this will indeed help the localization significantly. And so you can see already in the second set of panels, after incorporating an additional set of laser scans, there are only a few regions left. So there are only a few clusters of highly probable points in this discretized state space um, that seem to be viable given th that the robot took these two consecutive sensor measurements and measured the motion that it uh, moved by. Okay. And in the third panel, as it moved a little bit further to the right, you can see that now at this point there really only is one position um, that is, is highly probable given these measurements that it has taken, given the motion that it has measured. So, and you can see this cluster in the bottom left-hand corner of the map of this environment. Okay. So this is uh, just a representation of of how the belief updates might happen given a robot that is measuring its um, odometry and has a uh, one sensor that it is using, using for observation updates. So now let me talk a little bit about the alternative approach, which is the particle filter. So this filter is termed non-parametric because it does not rely on an underlying parametrized representation of state space. So what it does instead is it actually uses particles, where each particle is essentially a hypothesis of where the robot could be. So in other words, a particle is actually a candidate pose. So what's the key idea behind the particle filter? So the particle filter is basically a representation um, or a distribution that is composed of a set of samples drawn from uh, this distribution. And um, the belief in this case is simply represented by a set of random state samples that are drawn from this distribution. So as I mentioned before, a particle really is a hypothesis for a robot's state. Okay? And in the case of localization, the state is the robot's pose. And the role of the filter is to make sure that only the fittest particles survive the process, right? The process of the robot moving and making observations. So we want to somehow maintain a collection or a set of particles that corresponds to the measurements um, that the robot is taking. And we want to eliminate the particles that don't seem likely, and we want to recreate particles in um, regions of the state space that seem more likely. So that's the idea of the particle filter. And one of the key um, benefits of using particle filters um, beyond or as an alternative to other types of filters is that it really can represent any type of distribution because it's non-parametric. So you can think of distributions with multiple modes or skewed distributions. So highly non-Gaussian distributions, basically. Anything can be, be represented by this collection of particles. And at the same time, it's more efficient than our discrete Bayes filter we talked about because we're not actually discretizing the whole state space. We just maintain a set of M particles. So the memory utilization is fixed when we decide how many particles we actually want to maintain. So those are the benefits of using a particle filter. So just a bit of notation here. So we have our X, which is a collection of particles. A particle itself is represented by two values. So it's state hypothesis, in our case, a pose, and an important fact, an importance factor, or the particle's uh, weight. And M, as I mentioned before, is a, um, is, the, is a design parameter. So the algorithm designer will say, I need so and so many particles for this specific problem. And that's how we will um, continue with the, the, the to solve the localization problem with a fixed set of M particles. So now the next question we need to actually ask ourselves is, how are we actually going to represent a distribution with this now weighted set of particles. So how does that actually work? So the idea is that we can re represent our posteriors over a state X with a sum over all our particles. And in this case, what we do is we formalize this through Dirac's that are located at X and are weighted by W so that the sum is equal to one and we have a valid probability uh, density function.
So we, in these two panels, we have two examples of different distributions we could achieve with um, a particle filter or particle uh, representations. And you can see we have two continuous density functions um, in red and in blue, and these can be represented uh, by these set of particles where higher particle densities um, correspond to higher uh, probability um, density values. Okay? And so the key thing um, we have to keep and bear in mind with particles is that in the limit, so if we look at collections of an infinite number of particles, this actually this representation actually converges to the exact probability density function. So clearly we were already at this crossroads where we have to design systems that are composed of m particles, knowing that the smaller the m is, the more approximate our representation is going to be, but the higher the m is, the more computationally intensive our algorithms um, will, uh, will be. So that is the trade-off uh, that we will have to deal with when we use particle filters um, to solve our localization problem. Now, the key question that we need to answer in order to um, fully implement these filters is how are we actually going to obtain samples from our new target distributions, right? So the, the key point here is that we need to sample from our new posterior distributions to go around the loop in our particle filters. But the problem is that we don't actually have explicit representations from our posterior distributions to draw points from. And so this is the key kind of theoretical bottleneck that we need to find a solution to before we can actually employ this idea of particles uh, or particle representations for our filters. Now what we will leverage is this idea that we can actually sample from prior uh, beliefs because we had a prior belief from the last time step that we know how to update with our motion model. And we then follow up with a concept called importance sampling, which allows us to use samples from, our proposal, from a di proposal distribution, so essentially our prior, and we'll call this G, to generate new samples from the target distribution F, which is essentially our posterior. And intuitively, um, this, the method that we're, we're employing here um, will basically allow us to sample from a proposal distribution G, which is easy, and then weight the particles that are sampled according to a target distribution, which we can also do uh, very easily. And this then leads to a weighted collection of new samples representing our updated um, distribution. So that's the intuition behind how we're going to deal with um, sampling from uh, particle distributions to obtain our posteriors. Now, how do we integrate that idea into our uh, Bayes filter? So similarly um, to our Bayes filter, the particle filter will consist of three steps. Now, first of all, um, there, are for, there are three key steps that we will iterate over, which basically tells us, okay, we're gonna start by sampling particles from our proposal distribution, okay? Then we're going to compute importance factors, telling us how likely any particle is um, going to be. And given that we now have these weighted um, collections of particles, we're going to resample our particles and replace unlikely samples with more likely ones. Okay? So applied to localization, what does this mean? And I'm just going to connect this with the, the, the formal probability density functions that you're already fam familiar with. So our proposal distribution is given to us by our motion model, right? So our xi here, where i is indexing our particles, is sampled from uh, the motion model. The particles are then weighted by the measurement model, which is our pz given x. And it turns out that if the weight is sampled from this measurement model, this is exactly proportional to the quotient to the quotient that I showed you on the previous slide. And hence this idea of dividing by the proposal distribution and weighting by the target um, is a valid one when we apply the measurement model. And this is really the key underlying um, fundament that, that shows us that the that employing particle filters in this way is a valid way of implementing a Bayes filter. And the final thing that we do is then we, we resample our particles according to their uh, weight or importance factors. And also in order to do that, there are a couple of methods. 
Um, and I'll speak about this very briefly in the next slide, but you can look up one um, easy and viable method of doing this in Truon's book. So the, the way we would actually go about sampling particles from weighted particle distributions. So this is the pseudocode for the particle filter, um, otherwise known as Monte Carlo localization. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go through this algorithm for one time step. So what we do at the outset is we initialize a set of particles in our posterior as an empty set because our posterior contains no candidate poses at, at this point in time. Um, and then we loop through all particles in our prior um, and move them by the motion model. So that is what line four is doing for us. Line five then updates their weights given our measurement model. And line six then adds that particle um, to the posterior set that was previously empty. Right? Then what we do is we go through um, a second for loop for all our n particles to sample m particles from our given posterior distribution to return a new prior, which we will then use as input to the next time step. And we will repeat this procedure every time new sensor data comes in. And as I mentioned before, um, in line nine, we need to have a method that, is, that allows us to draw particles from discrete particle sets according to uh, their weights w and a method in order to do that is one so one viable alternative or, or option for this is presented in the probabilistic robotics book by Trun, and i encourage you to look at that method now again back to our uh, little illustration here that shows the story of a robot localizing itself in a world with three doors the only difference that you can see here now is that our distributions or our, our representations are given by sets of particles and we see how at each point in time when we say apply measurement models or motion models we um, have these particle sets uh, represented by weighted particles and then as we resample them the particle density adapts to the new um, situation that the robot finds itself in. And you can see in the final panel at the very bottom we have a very dense set of particles located at a set of poses that is likely given what the robot has done so far and seen thus far. So now I'd like to move on and talk a little bit about one final way of implementing the Bayes filter. So this time we're going to talk about the Kalman filter, which is actually a parametric way of implementing the Bayes filter, whereby we represent our distributions through Gaussians. So this method was actually first um, initiated or the initial developments of this method were started by Swirling in 58 and they were concluded and really um, published uh, famously by Kalman in 1960. Um, so famously that Kalman received the Medal of Honor in 74 for it in the Centennial, the IEEE Centennial Medal in 1984. Um, so Kalman filters, as some of you might well be aware of, are part of almost any estimation proce processes and procedures used in many um, cyber physical systems um, deployed in reality to date and are very, very common. So the general technique for predicting and filtering um, in a Kalman filter relies heavily on the assumption of linear systems, so linear dynamical systems, and Gaussian um, distributions. So the first thing is that we will be dealing with discrete time. And the second underlying concept is that uh, linear transformations, as given to us in linear dynamical systems, do conserve Gaussians. So Gaussians transformed linearly remain Gaussians. And what Kalman showed and what was so critical to making his filter such a success is that this process, this filter, is optimal in a least square sense. So it's optimal, it produces an optimal estimate of an updated state given certain state transitions and observations that are recorded. Um, so based on the processes being described as linear systems, um, 
we then have two key uh, components that compose or that are part, um, integral part of th this filter. The first component is our state transition model. Um, previously, we described this as, uh, or we used our motion model um, for this, where simply we're looking at um, how our state x of t is updated through um, a, a, linear, um, a, set, a linear transformation given matrices A and B and some process noise epsilon. And the second component is our measurement model, whereby our, our ZT is generated through um, a pose X of T and uh, some transformation C, and again, some process noise delta. Okay? So this is, those are the two cornerstones of the Kalman filter and how it updates a belief in the continuous domain um, being this, where we assume that our state is being described by Gaussians. So I just want to go through these matrices quickly and how we actually represent um, our systems such that we can use Kalman filters in order to compute over them. So we'll assume that we have a state space of dimensionality n and um, measurement dimensionality K and control dimensionality L. With these um, um, quantities in place, we have a matrix A, which is of dimension N by N, that describes how the state evolves from our previous time step to our current time step T without any controls um, or noise. So this is the pure evolution of the system. Then we have um, a matrix B that is an N by L matrix that describes how a control U of T um, changes the state from T minus one to T. We then have a matrix C that is a K by N matrix that describes how to map the state X to an observation Z. So what is the relationship of the state to um, a given observation? And then we have epsilon and delta that are random variables representing the process noise and measurement noise in, in, our, in a given system. And we assume that these two quantities are independent and normally distributed and are described by covariance matrices R and Q respectively. So let me illustrate uh, what the Kalman filter process might look like. So this process here goes round in, in a clockwise um, circle motion. And we'll start at the top left hand where we're given the blue um, distribution that represents essentially the robot's belief at the previous time step. If we then apply the state transition model, um, this gives us a, a predicted pose for the robot um, at this given time step after applying the motion that was measured, for example, through odometry readings. Um, and in other words, this, or using previously used terminology, this would be our prior, right? Then we receive a measurement that is uh, represented here by a Gaussian curve um, in cyan. And what we then do is we, we fuse this distribution with our prior, in essentially incorporating um, the measurement model to give us a corrected or our posterior distribution um, that tells us where we think the robot is now, given that we moved and we observed something. Okay, so this yellow distribution is our new prior for the beginning of our next cycle of this Kalman filter. Okay. Now looking a little bit deeper into our equations, um, I just want to explain two key um, components of the filter. So the first component is uh, the prediction step. So what this first step does is simply predict the next state by using the motion model. Um, the next step, state, x um, of t, is obtained by simply multiplying the previous state by the state transition matrix. And the next thing we do is we also uh, predict the covariance simply by multiplying the covariance matrix from the previous iteration, also by the state transition matrix A. And finally, we add R, which is uh, our process noise for this state transition, which also must follow a normal distribution since we're working with Gaussians. Now, in the correction step, in order to calculate um, the predicted measurement needed for the correction, we must actually first select the measurement components from the state. Okay, so basically, the, the idea is that the measurement either has the same structure as the state or it just contains um, parts of the state. Um, for example, uh, we're interested in just the robot's position. And so matrix C is the model selection matrix that, when multiplied with the state, selects only elements that belong to a measurement. Okay. 
And so finally, we then update um, the covariance sigma, um, whereby um, in order to make a correction, we must actually know the prediction error, which is given to us by something called the residual. And this residual is calculated by differencing the predicted measurement by the one that was actually obtained. And so this is how we update our covariance matrix. Okay, so as we update the covariance, matrix K actually specifies something that is called the Kalman gain. And this gain tells us how much we actually believe in the prediction versus how much we actually believe in our given measurement. So what was actually read by the sensor measurements. So let me put all of this back into context by looking at this um, in the form of an actual algorithm, so the actual filter. Um, and this is basically just um, uh, composed of three different steps. So we have our, our prediction step, we have the step where we compute our Kalman gain, and we have the step where we um, predict the correct, uh, compute the correction given the measurement that was read by the robot. And the key idea here really um, that Kalman proposed is this idea that the, the gain is a central component to all of this, which allows us to compute the degree to which the measurement is incorporated into the new state estimate. Right? So in other words, the Kalman gain allows the filter to arbitrate between motion and sensing. And for all of this, it's really important um, that uh, the covariances R and Q are accurately tuned in the sense that they really do represent um, the extent of uncertainty that uh, the robot is encountering given its current sensors and given its current uh, environment. And so finally, we can um, show our little illustration here again um, in the form of what these belief updates would look like given a common filter. And so here you can just see that both the belief and the models are represented by Gaussians. So analytically represented, uh, well, uh, formally we would be representing these analytically through their actual parametric forms. And um, the little illustration here also shows how they're nicely um, represented as, as Gaussians. So the key difference that you will note here to the prior illustrations is that in our very first time step, we actually start with a Gaussian that is located on the robot's actual position. And this is one of the key assumptions that is crucial to making common filters efficient. So you start with a rough estimate of where the robot is located. So in this particular case, the, case, the, the initial guess of where the robot is positioned is represented by a Gaussian that has a quite narrow um, standard deviation, so it's quite precise. We could imagine Gaussians that are more widely distributed and a little bit more uncertain, but uh, irrespective of that, we do need an initial estimate uh, in order to get the filter going, in order to be able to update um, the belief uh, based on what measurements are incoming. And here's another illustration that I find also very conducive to the understanding of how the robot's uncertainty evolves as the robot moves. So here we have a little example of localization based on odometry and um, an exteroceptive sensor that is capable of detecting a, a landmark that the robot then sees somewhere down the line of its little linear trajectory here. And what you can see here is that the trace of the robot's um, covariance, so the amount of uncertainty it has with respect to where it is located, increases as time moves forward and as the robot progresses along the straight line, as long as it doesn't make any measurements, right? And as soon as it makes a measurement of the landmark, you can see the trace reducing. So the uncertainty reduces to the point of when it moves past the landmark, it's seen it three times and it has a pretty good idea of where it is. And then again, when it starts moving forwards and has no more observations, so it's in dead reckoning mode, um, the uncertainty of the motion model means again that uh, the trace of the covariance matrix increases. So this is roughly what the process of um, a Kalman filter might look like in the case of a robot navigating along a trajectory. So now that you're familiar with three different localization algorithms, all based on the classical Bayes filter formulation, let's go ahead and compare these three different methods and talk about when it is potentially interesting to use one versus um, another. So in our first column, we have grid localization, which is the first algorithm we saw. 
which has key deficiencies in terms of memory and time efficiency. Because we're representing or we're fully discretizing the full state space um, in order to be able to, to compute over these discrete um, pose candidates. It's relatively robust, however, and also, um, of course, in terms of resolution, is quite flexible as long as we don't have any memory constraints. Um, not necessarily easy to implement. However, if you have a very simple state space representation, uh, and this can be easily done through robust implementation methods, this, uh, of course, can also be um, view viewed as a positive aspect of, of using grid localization. And we also saw how we can uh, initial initialize uniform distributions over the state space representations, hence unknown initial pose um, candidates are possible. In terms of Monte Carlo localization or the particle filter, we saw how it's a little bit more efficient in terms of memory and time because you can decide how many particles you want to instantiate and also how um, the, these particles are actually not just randomly, uh, they're, they're not uniformly distributed over state space, instead they can concentrate in areas of interest, so in poses that are highly like, likely. And hence we can be more effective with the memory, with the storage space uh, that we have to, dis to our disposition. Uh, similarly and analogously, efficiency in terms of processing is also a bit better than for grid localization. It's pretty robust also in the sense that we can model arbitrary distributions, so we're not bound to Gaussians. We also have a lot of flexibility in terms of resolution, so this scales of course with the number of particles that we instantiate. And it is actually commonly known that particle filters are relatively easy to get up and running quite quickly. Although I do want to uh, make a small caveat here, there are quite a few things that need to be tuned when you set up a particle filter and getting those just right is possibly um, not quite that straightforward. And again, as with grid localization, we can have unknown initial positions by simply initial, initializing a uniform distribution over space where we just distribute our m particles um, randomly uh, at uniform, uniformly at random. And finally, we have our Kalman filters or the nonlinear version, extended Kalman filters, where we're assuming, um, especially in the linear case, that everything is Gaussian. And of course, the positive thing about uh, this way of computing over estimates and updates is very efficient in memory as well as in time because we have parametric representations um, for all the quantities that we're trying to track. Um, and of course, resolution is also ideal in the sense that we're looking at analytical models and not a discretized or quantized version of uh, the world that we're trying to represent. And so these are the, the strong sides of using Kalman filters versus the two discrete versions um, we talked about previously. The downside is that um, given that we're only modeling state space with Gaussians and we're modeling updates with Gaussians, these models tend to break down when sensors and the world and everything around us does not behave in a Gaussian manner. So this is one strong downside um, to the Kalman filter. However, I also want to note here that there are several extensions to the Kalman filters that have been developed and devised in order to counteract um, the, the Gaussian assumption issues. And finally, we do have this, um, this assumption or requirement that we start off at a given initial pose. Even if that pose can be instantiated with a very, very large uncertainty, we still need to set one. So, so much for a comparison of our three different um, localization algorithms. Now, I'd like to round off this course by talking about maths a little bit, because we made this underlying assumption for all these three methods that maps were available to us because we were using the maps so that our sensor measurements led to meaningful ob observations and meaningful updates in, within our filters. And now the key question is, well, how are we actually going to represent these maps so that we can compute over them and so that our sense of measurements can be interpreted as a function of the features that have locations in these maps, right? And so there are two key ways we can think about this. One way of representing maps is through a semantic representation. And the other way we can think about maps is in a metric um, representation.
So in semantic maps, we're thinking of features, um, which could, for example, be represented by topological constructs, which in terms of uh, memory requirements is very efficient because we'll only um, store the elements or the features that we're really interested in. However, they do. Re this requires a little bit more of a design effort because we have to think about, well, what is the representation going to be and which features I'm going, am I going to model and how am I going to model them so that I can interpret sensor measurements accordingly. Metric maps, however, are, are simpler in the sense that we exhaustively map out our space, for example, through a volumetric map or a grid map. Um, through, for example, regular tessellations. And within these maps, we then have some um, rules or a paradigm by which we decide how to model occupancy versus uncertainty of occupancy so that sensor measurements, again, can be interpreted as a function of, of the, of the um, entry within uh, volumetric cells. Just a little bit more on these volumetric representations because they are quite common in um, many textbooks. So, so grid maps or volumetric maps in, in the 3D world is simple, simply a collection of, of discretized cells that then together represent our state space. And here, given that we know where our obstacles are, all we need to do is associate a given value um, in space to a certain um, entry that we're making with respect to the object that is occupying that given location. So in the simplest version, we could say that a cell is either occupied or free, or perhaps we, we, we don't really know. And in that case, we give it a probability of being occupied that is somewhere in between the two. And this is a, a non-parametric model, which means that it is quite intensive in terms of memory. Um, however, it's very easy to design and can be, very, um, can be derived from given maps in a very straightforward way with very little processing and very little design effort from the user who's trying to use these maps in order to localize. And um, then other, one more nice thing about these um, grid map representations is that we can use them within a probabilistic um, paradigm for mapping purposes as well as for localization purposes. And so this then leads me to my very last slide and my last topic, which is SLAM, something that I didn't touch upon at all in this course, but something I do want to mention because it essentially touches upon the question of what to do when both location and the map are unknown. So SLAM is essentially the algorithm that creates this correspondence or the mapping between locations in space and the maps that we're creating in order to model what's, what's being seen by the robot as it moves through this space. So SLAM is an incredibly difficult problem, although it is argued in literature that this is by now a solved problem. So theoretically, we know how to solve SLAM. So why is it actually still hard? So SLAM intuitively is a hard problem because it's a chicken or egg problem. You need a map to localize yourself within this map. And at the same time, you need a pose within this map to be able to decide whether or not a given location in space is occupied by a given obstacle or object or not, right? So here, here's the chicken or egg problem. Now, what compounds this chicken or egg problem is that we have errors in the robot pose and errors in the map which can be correlated. And uncorrelating these errors is key to being able to find or construct uh, the correct pose and the correct map estimates. And finally, we have something which is called the data associate, uh, association problem, which is, well, the robot doesn't really know where it is, but it is seeing three, two or three landmarks. Now the question is, is it seeing the two landmarks on the left given its position uncertainty, or is it seeing the two on the right given its position uncertainty? And depending on which it really is seeing, it will map those objects into the given um, positions in its current map template that it is trying to build from where it thinks that it is currently located. So, so these problems all compound uh, the, the complexity of developing efficient SLAM algorithms. Now, how does one actually go about solving SLAM? So the key insight to the solution of SLAM is that after the robot has moved around a bit, seen a bunch of the environment and returns to a pose that it has already, already visited before, the uncertainties in the robot's um, localization tend to collapse because it's visiting an already visited spot 
um, again and is recognizing things that it saw before and it recognizes that it should be closing the loop on a path that it started X time steps ago. So this is called loop closure. And when loop closure happens, what, what goes on in the robot's um, computations is that from all the many possible maps and all the many possible paths that lead throughout this map to the same location, there tends to be just one map that works and one path that works. And there's only one alignment of that path within that map that leads the robot to that very same position again. And that's the magic of uh, the solution to the SLAM algorithm. So I'm not going to go into more detail on SLAM, but I just wanted to prime you that this problem exists and that there are solutions towards the this problem that also have been de developed. And it is one of the most, um, still today, most studied problems in the area of mobile robot localization and autonomy and long-term autonomy uh, in, in specific. So rounding off, I just want to conclude by summarizing the key concepts that I want you to take away from this course today. So the foundation of everything that we saw is the base filter. We talked a little bit about the, um, found the mathematical foundations of the base filter and how to take them and transform them into algorithms that we can actually implement on robots in order to do uh, or to solve the useful problem of localization. We, see it, we saw three variants of the localization algorithm. So we saw grid localization, Monte Carlo localization, and the Kalman filter. And we saw that these all depend on some version of representing models and representing the state space and also require representation of maps. And we talked a little bit about all of these different um, variants in this lecture. And finally, I talked briefly about SLAM and I hope uh, I have piqued your interest into all these various problems. And to conclude, I do invite you to look further into, um, I would argue this is one of the most seminal books on the topic, in order to delve a little bit deeper into any of the uh, questions and topics um, that I presented today. So with this, I'm going to conclude this lecture, and I look forward to speaking to you in the next lecture.